when Jesus was dying on the cross, there was a thief next to him. And the thief said to him, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. What's up, YouTube? Ryan here. Welcome back to 1517 Films, where on every episode, I am always contending for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. Today is part two of whether or not Jesus is a liar. Stick around. That's right. I'll bet that you know the Bible says this, this, and this, but did you know by simply taking one verse out of context, you can undo all of Christianity. I'm Ryan, and I'm speaking as if I were Morg Official. That's right. Morg Official dealt with in part one, addressing the why. Why does Morg think this way? Because he was hurt by mainline American Protestantism and bad eschatology, bad theology and study of the end times. Mainline American Protestants don't understand the end times and they abused him as a child. Now, this is not something that we or I should take delight in. We shouldn't delight in this. The only mockery that I've expressed thus far is towards the idea, not the man. The idea that, hey, I know you've studied Christianity your whole life, but did you know that I took this one verse out of context in order to prove your entire faith is stupid? Now, <laughs> so what this is, is apologetics. I step into apologetics every now and then on this channel, and if that interests you, then click the subscribe button, ring the notification bell, like, share, and always Leave me a comment. Did I miss an argument? Did I misspeak? I misspoke in part one of this episode and someone was kind enough to comment and, and I could clarify what I, what I intended to say. So that's actually very helpful. So part one uh, addressed why he thinks this way. Now we're going to get into the argument itself. I bet you were wondering, Ryan, it's been a couple weeks since you did part one. Are you ever going to address part two or are you just going to say that there's an answer and then... Leave it alone. There is an answer. The problem with his argument stems on his understanding of one word. The word being generation. But I'm not going to put words in his mouth. Let's listen to Morg explain, and then we'll dissect the argument. So Jesus is out talking with his disciples, and they ask him about the end of the world. In Matthew 24, 3, they ask Jesus, And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? So Jesus begins to describe to them all the terrible things that are going to happen. He talks about wars and bloodshed, earthquakes, disease, deceit, famines. He talks about how the rapture will occur and people will vanish. No, actually. You read through the entire text. And he does not talk about the rapture. And that's a problem because he's hung up on the rapture. And if you go into part one, you'll see how the rapture terrified him as a kid. But there's no such thing as the rapture. All of those verses about the rapture are about Jesus' second coming and the resurrection from the dead. Case closed. But he's lying or he hasn't read the text. Because they don't, Jesus never mentions a rapture. Never mentions a rapture. So uh, we're going to address that he started in the wrong place. And already he's putting words in Jesus' mouth. He talks about the sun darkening, the moon no longer giving light, and the stars falling from heaven, and how he's going to return in the clouds. Matthew 24, 29 through 30 says... After the time of suffering, the sun will darken, the moon won't produce light, the stars will fall from the sky, and the heavenly powers will be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So that's all well and good, but listen carefully to what he says next. Matthew 24, 33 through 34 says, When you see all these things, know that it is near at the doors. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Did you catch it? He's talking to his disciples and he says that everything he just described, the end times, the tribulation, the second coming is going to occur 
before this generation passes. He tells his disciples that when they see all the disasters he just described, that his second coming is near and the generation will not pass before it happens. Uh, he's about 2000 years late. That's pretty bad, but it gets worse because this isn't the first time that he said this. In Matthew 16, 27 through 28, Jesus says, for the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they have done. Truly I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. You can't get more clear than that. Clearly this is a lie. So why isn't this proof positive that mainstream Christianity is false? Obviously it is. Jesus said he'll return before some of the people in front of him are still alive, or before the generation has passed. That didn't happen. He didn't. So why do people still believe in mainstream Christianity? It should be case closed right there. Jesus lied. <laughs> Hi, my name is Morg Official, and not only can I take things out of context, I can compare apples to oranges, tell you they're the same thing so that you feel dumb. Welcome to Morg Official. All right, so he did not start in the proper place when he quoted out of Matthew chapter 24. I said in the previous video, there are three rules to proper biblical exegesis, and those rules are context, context, and context. And I also suggested that we should read our Bible with 2020 vision. So we, at, at a maximum, we should at least try to read 20 verses before and 20 verses after. Now, in prepping for this video, I have done that. That being the case, I am going to be upfront and honest with you when I am omitting certain verses. See, he just, he, he started, actually, he started in the middle of a verse. Saying it was the verse, but he started in the middle of it. Then he jumped to another section, and then he jumped to another section. See, this is what the Bible says. But that stuff in the middle is important. So let me take a look here. I just want to make sure. Ah, yes. Let's, um... Oh, it, oh it's earlier in Matthew. So we're going to start with Matthew chapter 24. And who is messaging me? Oh. And... We're going to start right away at the beginning of Matthew 24, not halfway through verse 3, at the beginning of Matthew 24. Jesus left the temple and was going away when his disciples came to point out to him the buildings of the temple. But he answered them, You see all these, do you not? Truly I say to you, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. Now, Morg left this out, and this is vitally important because this couple of verses explains why they ask the question that they ask, and he omitted part of the question. So now we begin at verse 3 at the beginning. As he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the close of the age? So he skipped, tell us, when will these things be? What things? Well, he just got done telling them that the stones of the temple are going to be torn down. So what things do you think they're asking him about? The temple. Oh, and by the way, what will be the sign of your coming? Oh, and by the way, the close of the age. They asked three questions. When is the temple going to be torn down? What is the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? But did, did Morg point that out? No, he skipped. He left out all of that business about the temple because then in Jesus answering of these three questions, he can make Jesus look stupid. But we have to understand Jesus is answering three questions. And Jesus loves to keep the main thing the main thing. So Jesus keeps the main thing the main thing, and then he breaks it down. Starting at verse 4. And Jesus answered them, See that no one leads you astray, like Morg. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place. But the end is not yet. 
For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are but the beginning of the birth pains. It's a pretty vague answer. So to answer all of it, he answered by saying crap that they're already seeing, wars and rumors of wars, false prophets and, and false messiahs coming and going, all of this. The, the, and, and we're going to address why he does that, I think, uh, when we go to his Matthew 16 argument. Now the main thing. Them, they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will go cruel, grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. Now Morg skipped this verse. So I want to read it again. This is Matthew 24, 14. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. Keep that verse in the back of your mind. So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, let the reader understand this is a special note that Matthew put into his gospel. Let the reader understand. So while fundamentalists and mainline American evangelicals are looking for the abomination of desolations, you know, you know, when Nikolai Carpathia stands up in the rebuilt temple and says that he's God after he got shot in the head and raised three days later, that desolation, oh, no, 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 no. The abomination that causes desolation was uh, a statue that a Roman emperor erected in the temple, and then the temple got torn down in 70 AD. Let the reader understand. The evangelicals, that prophecy has been fulfilled. Stop looking for it. Then those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. That was verse 16. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down to take what is in his house, and let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas, for women who are pregnant, or for those who are nursing infants in those days... Pray that your flight may not be in winter or on a Sabbath, for then there will be great tribulation, such has not been from the beginning of the world until now. No, and never will be. And if those days had not been cut short, no human would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders, so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. So if they say to you, look, he is in the wilderness, do not go out. If they say, look, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. What did Jesus just describe to them? Well, he kept the main thing the main thing. And he, um, anyone who's written a paper knows that you put your concluding argument at the end. So the concluding argument is... Uh, verse 14, and this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. So he answered all of those questions at once. There's going to be wars and rumors of wars and false Christs and false prophets, but not until the gospel is proclaimed to the whole world will the end come. Now, let's answer your question about the temple. There's going to be an abomination of desolation, which was spoken of in Daniel. When you see that, get out. Get out. Because the Romans are coming and they're going to wage war on Jerusalem and they're going to tear down the temple. This occurred in 70 AD. Prophecy fulfilled. Now, the coming of the Son of Man. Starting at verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to another. Maybe that's what he meant by the rapture, but this is definitely not a rapture verse and even rapture advocates won't go to this verse to support the rapture. From the fig tree, verse 32, 
Learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So alas, when you see all these things, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. So there it is. There it is. Jesus lied because he said it to them. They're a generation. They died. All these things, all these things, all, all. I know, I know evangelicals don't know the meaning of the word all, especially when applied to who is baptism for, all. They have no idea what the word all means and that you were raised as a mainline Protestant. So of course you don't know the meaning of the word all. All means, and get this, all. <laughs> so all of these things. Verse 14 and this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. So it is distinctly possible from the text that we know Jesus is not saying a literal generation, but a generation in which the gospel will be proclaimed. Go back to video part one and see all the times where he talks about the thousand-year reign of Christ. And I actually made an articulate slip-up in that. What I meant to say in that video was any time 1,000 is mentioned in the Bible, it is always figurative. And then we get to the book of Revelation where it says Christ will reign for a 1,000 years, and all of a sudden evangelicals take that literally. So 1,000 <clears throat> being figurative throughout the whole of the Bible, meaning a period of time known only to God, this generation, what generation? The generation that sees the gospel proclaimed to the whole world, that generation shall not pass away until all of these things have been fulfilled. So how do, uh, was Jesus talking about them in regard to his second coming? No, he was talking about the generation that sees the gospel proclaimed to the entire world world. And it's also important to take the Bible as a whole and in complete context. Why, Morg, is it taking 2,000 years? Because God loves you. Because God is patient. Because God does not delight in the death of a sinner, but that they turn from their evil ways and live. So it is God's forbearance, it is his patience, and it is his love for you that he waits and he withholds his coming so that everyone can hear the gospel. So that the gospel can go into the ears of all of mankind. Every beating heart can be preached the gospel, have an opportunity for repentance, and to believe said gospel. It is love that keeps God from coming back as quickly as you'd like. And it is love that keeps God from coming back as quickly as the Protestants would like. Every day that we wake up and Jesus hasn't come should be a day of rejoicing for us because we get to go out into the world and preach the gospel one more time to a brand new set of ears that haven't heard it before. So what generation, Morg, what generation shall not pass away until all of these things have been fulfilled? The one that sees the gospel proclaimed to all of the earth that generation. But you claim Jesus did this before. He said this before, and even more specifically, shall not taste death. Some of you, and he even said, standing here, shall not taste death. So now Jesus is talking directly to a group of people in front of him and telling them some of them aren't going to die until they see what he's talking about. Apple, we just got done addressing the apple. Now let's go talk about the orange that Morg is trying to tell you is an apple. So we go back to Matthew 16. <clears throat> and I'm going to start at the beginning of verse 16, not where he did. And the Pharisees and Sadducees, this is verse 1 of 16, came out to test him. They asked him to show them a sign from heaven. He answered, When it is evening, you say, It will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be stormy today, for the sky is red and threatening. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given it except the sign of Jonah. So he left them and departed. So that again, Jesus says, generation. 
It is a weak, wicked and adulterous generation that seeks after a sign. And only one sign is going to be given to any generation that could be conceived as wicked and adulterous. By the way, it's all of them. And that is the sign of Jonah. What is the sign of Jonah? Well, as Jonah was three days in the belly of the fish, so too would the Son of Man be three days in the belly of the earth. But just as th Jonah was thrown up by the fish because he had to preach the word, so too Christ was, death threw up Christ because it could not hold him, was not meant to hold him, so that the gospel could be proclaimed. This is the sign, the one and only sign that you and I will ever get to validate our faith. Jesus was crucified, died, and buried, and on the third day, he rose again. Doesn't matter what generation we're in. That's the sign for a wicked and adulterous generation. So again, generation doesn't mean group of people to Jesus. It means, or uh, age bracket of people to Jesus. It means people who think a certain way. The more you know. Verse 5. Then when the disciples reach the other, oh, we're going to skip this. So this is about the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So we are going to skip verse 5 through verse 12. Now I'm being honest with you. I'm omitting those. Those aren't pertinent to this. This is a callback to something that happened previously. <clears throat> so we begin at verse 13. Peter confesses Jesus as the Christ. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And I would also like to point out, evangelicals, that the binding and loosing thing is tied to the keys of the kingdom, and Jesus gave those keys in John chapter 20 after his resurrection, and the binding and the loosing is directly connected to the forgiveness of sins. Not binding um, Jezebel spirits from people. You don't bind things from people. Uh, by the way, you bind things to people. You loose things from people. So you jacked up evangelicals need to get your verbiage right. But we continue. Uh, verse 20. He strictly charged his disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. Then we get to verse 21. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Then Jesus told his disciples, verse 24, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Who forever, for whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits its soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. Truly, I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. <clears throat> so we know from Jesus' own words about the... the um, the Pharisees, that a generation he defines here as a group of people who are wicked and adulterous. That's how he defines it. And we know, I'm really sorry that I was distracted for that. I'm pretty sure my Instacart just got dropped off. <laughs> Why did God give me corners of my eyes? So that was a lot of the more scripture reading than Morg has provided. So we know that Jesus said, defines a generation differently than Morg would ex expect him to. Kind of going back to the reference to a thousand in the Bible, never being literal unless we get to Revelation, which is apocalyptic literature, and all of a sudden a thousand is literal. And we get Jesus, we get Peter's confession. You are the Christ. 
And P Jesus says, God revealed this to you, not, not the will of the flesh. So there goes decision theology out the window. And upon this rock, the rock of Peter, was it Instacart? The rock of Peter's confession. Will Christ build his church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. But it's interesting and it's important that we continued through that instead of just skipping to the verses that we think we're talking about. Because then Jesus goes on to tell them that he's going to die, suffer, die, and rise again. <clears throat> and Peter says, no. At which, when Peter tells Jesus, I'm not going to let you suffer, I'm not going to let you die, Jesus says, get behind me, Satan, because it is the work of the Son of God to come, to suffer, to die, to make satisfaction and propitiation for sins. So anyone who stands in the way of Christ going to the cross is of the devil, because this is what he must do. So, then, Jesus says, pick up your cross, deny yourself, follow me. Bearing in mind that Jesus has been talking about his suffering, death, and resurrection. This is what he's been talking about, and that's why I read through those verses. Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Now, coming in his kingdom is not the same thing as Matthew 24 when he comes to judge the living and the dead. So, for the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. Period. New sentence. Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. When Jesus was dying on the cross, there was a thief next to him. And the thief said to him, Jesus... Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And did Jesus say, hey, man, you got to wait for the sun to be darkened and the stars to fall out of the sky and you got... No, Jesus said, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Let's go to John chapter 1. Don't you love the sound of Bible pages? Luke, John chapter 1. Because it's his whole, Morg's whole argument hinges on whether or not the people, his disciples, saw any of this. Did the disciples see any of this? John 1, verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Yeah, they saw it. They saw his glory when he was baptized. And God the Father spoke from heaven. They saw his glory on the Mount of Transfiguration. But ultimately, what John is talking about, what all of the Gospels point us to, the glorification of the Son of God comes when he is crucified. As a matter of fact, Jesus would later say, later in John, um, where is it? In, verse, or in chapter 13, uh, one of you will betray me, beginning at verse 21, and he goes through about how they don't know who it is, and they're asking, who's it going to be? And he says, it's going to be the person that I give the bread to, and he gives it to Judas. And uh, Jesus says to, or verse 27 of chapter 13 says, Then after he had taken the morsel, Satan entered into him. Jesus said to him, What you are going to do, do quickly. And no one at the table knew what he why he said this. Some thought that maybe Judas had the money bag. Judas was telling, Jesus was telling him, uh, buy what we need for the feast, or that he should give some money to the poor. So after receiving the morsel of bread, he immediately went out, and it was night. So Jesus says, on the night he's betrayed, one of you is going to betray me. It's going to be the person to give the bread to. He gives the bread to Judas Iscariot. Satan enters into Judas Iscariot. Jesus says, whatever you're going to do, do it quickly. Judas leaves. Verse 31. When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified. And God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him at once. And this is beautiful. I'm just going to keep reading. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. You will seek me, and just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you love 
or if you have love for one another. John chapter 13, verse 31. And when he had gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified. So Morg thinks, and Morg has, evangelicals don't understand glory. God's definition of glory is suffering. We are glorified when we suffer. Christ was glorified in his suffering. The life of a Christian is going to be a life of hatred and retribution and suffering and persecution and condemnation from the world and death. Horrid martyrdom. This is the life of the Christian. But this is the glory of God. And we rejoice in this. That, we, that one would have the opportunity to tell the world, no, you move. I stand with Christ and be killed for it. Ah! But that doesn't mean seek it out. <laughs> Read the martyrdom of Polycarp and you will see a clear warning about how you're not supposed to seek out martyrdom. Um, but when was Jesus glorified? He was glorified at the cross. In his suffering, in his passion that began on the night when he was betrayed. And John will later go on to say uh, that the disciples said <clears throat> on that night, finally you're speaking plainly and not figuratively. Ah, uh, John 16, verse 29. His disciples said, ah, now you are speaking plainly and not using figurative speech. Now we know that you will, that you know all things and do not need anyone to question you. This is why we believe that you came from God. So on the night in which Jesus was betrayed, the disciples said, now you are speaking plainly and not using figurative speech. That's right. The sacrament of the altar is not figurative. Jesus was speaking plainly and not using figurative speech. But I digress. <laughs> you know what? That is enough for today. There's more. We, we need to address the, the, the sun failing to shine, the moon turning to blood, and the stars falling down. And we need to address the kingdom of God. What is the kingdom of God? But I'm going to expand this into a part three episode because this has gone on far too long. Far too long. But what have we learned thus far? Jesus said all of these things. And one of those things is that the gospel will be proclaimed to the entire earth. So the generation that sees the gospel proclaimed to all the earth, that is the generation that shall not pass away until they see the coming of the Son of Man. And, by the way, when Jesus said, some of you shall not taste death until you see the Son of Man coming into his kingdom, we know he was talking about his death on the cross. And did the disciples see these things, the glory of the Son of God? Absolutely they did. And we have seen his glory, John says. So they saw all of this. And in part three, we're going to go to the book of Acts. And we're going to talk about the sun being dark and the moon turning to blood and the stars falling out of the sky. Until next time, may God richly bless you and the grace and mercy won for you by Jesus' vicarious death on the cross for all of your sins.